Hi, I'm Tim, and this is part 4 of the course on building products with JavaScript. And before we get to the main topic, I want to thank the people who send their pull requests to fix and adjust things that uh, I missed and, you know, did a bit poorly in the uh, project that we're building currently. So thanks to Elias for the unit tests and fix uh, for the non-existent URLs here. So you can see he did a pretty great job to test this stuff. Um, I think we fixed the bug together and I was the one who pushed it, but he added the test. And thanks to Frank for uh, fixing some spelling errors and also suggesting a better ESLint configuration for uh, handling the next rule uh, in the um, ExpressJS um, uh, request handlers instead of just disabling it per line. Uh, he suggested using this args ignore pattern, which I think is way better. So thank you guys for this. And, you know, if you see something that is wrong with my project or that there are places for improvements, you know, there always are, feel free to send your pull requests. I will be happy to accept all of them or at least, you know, discuss and uh, figure out how to proceed from there. All right, now that we're done, uh, today's video is going to be about databases and Docker. Uh, so before, uh, let's start with databases first. And uh, before we go into in-depth, uh, basically, I want to tell you, you know, there's SQL and no SQL databases. We're going to be using this um, Microsoft Azure article as an illustration because they have some nice images here. Uh, but, you know, if you've been developing software, you probably know that databases are like very important part of it. And uh, you probably heard that they are like SQL and no SQL databases, right? So no SQL is a, a sort of uh, gained popularity quite recently, although they've been around for quite some time now. And uh, as you, uh, let me zoom in a bit. So as you can see here, um, I don't know why Microsoft categorizes them this way, but that's actually not, I would not agree that this is completely true. I think SQL can be used for um, all the things that no SQL can be used to, but they just the way that you use them is quite different. So what's the difference? Well, SQL is the uh, generally table-based uh, databases, so you store things in relational tables, which have this strictly defined structure, right? Uh, if we take the top uh, databases, it would be something like um, MySQL and PostgreSQL, which is the um, one that is, I guess, most popular right now. And uh, it comes down to tables, Relation, that have relationship between each other and uh, strict schemas because the tables once created cannot be changed. I mean, of course they can, but that's usually a lot of pain to do so. So you basically, if you know exactly what you want before starting, you can be very efficient with it. And, you know, uh, SQL, which is the structured query language, helps you a lot with uh, doing like relational joins and all that kind of stuff. Uh, another point is that the SQL databases are very, very scalable vertically. So the more hardware you throw at them, the better they perform. And this is like way better in comparison to a NoSQL database. But in contrary to a NoSQL databases, SQL databases are pretty hard to uh, scale horizontally. So it's uh, the sharding due to the way that the database, uh, the data is stored in the database is pretty hard and usually requires either additional extensions or a completely different application layer that actually handles this distribution of the data over several databases. Uh, NoSQL, on the other hand, um, can be of several types. Let me scroll. I think they had a nice image here. No, not here. Uh, but yeah, we can we can stay here. Why not? Uh, NoSQL, uh, on the other hand, is uh, there are four types of them. So first one is key value store, which is you know this dumb one you provide a key uh, and you can assign a value to it which is something like um, what was the name of it redis this is probably one of the most popular ones then you have the document stores and this is like mongodb and uh, rethinkdb you know and all of those ones that you probably hear about all the time uh, people talking about no scale generally if for some reason talk about um, data oriented or document oriented uh, databases then we have graph databases is a very interesting part as well. So there's uh, stuff like Virtuoso, um, Neo4j, and all those kind of things. They store uh, data in triples or quadruples sometimes for better indexing. And the idea is that you store data as subject predicate object. So, you know, like person has name uh, or person name and then the uh, last, the object uh, part of the triple basically denotes the name. 
Uh, those databases work really well when you have a complex data structure which you need to query efficiently. So uh, if, you, if you're interested, I mean, feel free to ask me uh, because this is like one of the things that I do during my job. I work with uh, Sparkly and Semantic Web. And you can do some very fancy things with querying using Sparkly. So um, yeah. And then you have the white column stores. Um, something like Cassandra or HBase. So this is the area that I can't really tell you much about because I don't really work with them and um, I only briefly know how they work. So we'll leave that. And the main thing about all of those or most of those is that they are, uh, they have either dynamic or very flexible schemas as you can see here. So the idea is that, you know, if you create a schema in SQL, it's really hard to change it. But if you use NoSQL database, you can basically mutate your documents with uh, pretty easily. And you know, if it's a key value store, you don't have any schema at all. So it's up to you, basically. Another thing is because you have documents, uh, but not tables and not uh, strict schemas, or I guess it's rather just not tables, but rather documents like atomic units, you can very easily shard and replicate data across several instances of the database. And this is like considered to be one of the strengths of the uh, NoSQL databases is the ease of sharding and replication. So it's really easy to create several instances of the database that will share the data and improve the performance. So it's basically way better horizontal scalability on this side. On the other hand, they are not so scalable vertically because uh, Obviously, if you throw more hardware at them, they will work better, but in comparison to uh, SQL databases, that's not even close to the performance that you can get from SQL. All right, so this is sort of short introduction into SQL databases, and uh, now I want to tell you about RethinkDB. So this is what we are going to use in this course, so for this project. Uh, it is a document-oriented uh, database, and the main advantage of it, so why, why I pick this, why I don't pick like MongoDB or something similar, is uh, the real time part. So basically the idea is that you can uh, do this changes uh, operator, which will create a query that will continuously return results whenever the query actually changes. So any, any documents that should be included in a query changes. So basically say if you monitor the changes on your table of users, you will get all the new users or all the changed users. And since we don't want to do a real-time app, that is very, very handy. And in addition to this, I just like how the everything to be is done. It's an open source database. Uh, it's schema-less, but there are ways to enforce schema uh, on the client side, basically. And uh, it's actually pretty fast. So it, it's coded completely in C, if I'm not mistaken. Let's have a look at the GitHub here. I think it was C database, and essentially they wrote it as a database for SSDs. Yeah, there you go, 50% in C, so it's uh, essentially C. They have a weird mix of JavaScript and CoffeeScript here as well, but whatever. So uh, they started it as a database for SSD drives, and then later changed into a real-time database. And I think it works really well. So it has way less problems than MongoDB, uh, at least for me. So I had some issues with the Mongo for my projects, but I guess maybe RethinkDB just fits better for the tasks that I have to do. It works extremely well when you need to track real-time changes. So, and you know, that's exactly why we're gonna have it. And uh, as well, sharding in this one is just so, so simple. Okay, now that we've figured out the databases, Let's talk about the next part of the lecture or of the video, uh, Docker. So this is the slides that I um, created uh, for the presentation that I did in, in uh, my research group that I introduced the guys to Docker. I'm just gonna go through them quickly and tell to you, you know, what Docker is and why it's really useful. All right, so what's the idea? The problem, or what's the problem here, I guess, first, right? The problem is that we have a ton of things that we work on, including, you know, static websites, databases, front ends, queues, analytics, endpoint, like REST endpoints, API endpoints, uh, maybe some background workers, as you can see here. And we have to deploy all of that in different environments. We have to work on that. So basically it should be in development machine. We have to send it back to the uh, QA team to ensure the quality. 
we have to run it in some continuous integration clusters to make sure the test passes. Then we have to deploy it to production in some public cloud. And then maybe we also deploy it to customers. And then there are contributors who also want to run it on their machines. And if you ever try to install this or, you know, work on third party open source project in GitHub, you know how painful it can be to actually make it run if they don't have something like make install, make run. So, and this is what the Docker people call matrix from hell. So how do you take all of this and make it run consistently and in the same manner on all of these machines? It can be problematic. The thing is that this uh, this is not a new problem. There was this exactly the same problem in cargo transport that was uh, pre-1960s. So what exactly did they do there? Well, they, uh, I mean, okay, so they had exactly the same matrix from hell, you know, the various transports, various things they need to transport and no way to transport it in a consistent manner. So how did they solve it? Well, they created a intermodal shipping container, which was introduced in the 60s and Basically, it has the exact same size and you can fit almost anything into it and you can transport it using any of those uh, transports. So the Docker is basically a container system for code. You can fit pretty much anything into it. So as long as you can run it on Linux, basically you can encapsulate anything. And you know, since most of the server stuff runs on Linux, you can do it there as well. Uh, Microsoft is actually working on doing the Windows uh, Docker containers, like the, not the host, because you can already run it on Windows, but the container itself to be like Windows, uh, I guess NT-based. So it's pretty interesting to see if they can manage to pull that off, then basically would mean you can have anything inside of Docker container. But for now, it's just limited to Linux. So, and you can take that container and run it on any of those, uh, you know, development, public cloud, production, cluster, contributors, laptop, whatever. Works in a nice way and it solves this uh, matrix from hell. So basically you just take Docker container and run it everywhere. It works in exactly the same way. So why should you care about that? Well, it's uh, sort of built once, finally, you know, the thing that Java promised and run anywhere, where anywhere actually means an x86 server running a modern, modern Linux kernel, which is 3.2 or uh, older, I think. So, yeah, I mean, um, it's kind of anywhere. So, <laughs> yeah, but let's see what it actually provides. It gives you a safe, clean and portable uh, runtime environment for your app. You don't have to worry about any missing dependencies or packages because they're all going to be inside of the container. Each app will run its own isolated container and won't interfere with, with each other, obviously, aside from the resource consumption. Uh, you can automate testing, integration, packaging, and you know whatever is you can imagine using Docker. You can reduce or completely eliminate, in some cases, concerns about compatibility on different platforms because it's anyway going to run in a container. And you know, if you, if you have a Linux kernel, basically you can have anything. It is, and the containers themselves are very cheap. They have almost zero penalty uh, to to deploy services. So uh, in compare in contrast. Let's try that again. In contrary to the virtual machines, where you actually create a virtual machine that would allocate, uh, have the resources allocated to it, and it will actually take, you know, two gigabytes of RAM, capture it completely, and then do some uh, file system capturing, like capture 10 gigabytes of hard drive or whatever you allocate to it. Containers don't do that. They share resources. So it's really, really cheap to deploy a bunch of containers on the same machine. And you also have instant replay and reset of image snapshots, which means that if you run a service and then you decide, okay, I don't need it anymore, for example, database, you can just stop it, kill it, restart it, and then you will have a new clean state. So whatever was in the very beginning, which is a really cool in development when you don't want a database, you can just wipe it and restart it with one command. Okay, uh, so yeah, now let's talk about what's the difference between the virtual machine and the container. So as I already said, the virtual machines generally allocate a bunch of resources, but that's not all. They also run the guest OS. So you have the, if you do the virtual machine, you have the server, then you have the host OS, then you have some sort of hypervisor, and then each VM has its own guest OS and uh, binaries and libraries that your app is using. So basically, once you create a second VM with your app, uh, the copy of your app, you will have exactly the same thing and once again, you know, and the same goes for the different apps. With the containers, it's way, 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 way better because they share operating system and where appropriate, they share binaries and libraries. So as you can see here, 
All we have is a host operating system. We have the Docker, which as well works as a layer application layer, so it's not under the containers. It's actually a completely separate thing. And then we have shared binaries and libraries for application, and we just have different application versions. So as you can see here, for B it's even better because there's a bunch of uh, app B running, and but we're still only duplicating the uh, basically the, the application binaries what we need to. We don't copy everything. So that allows us to have way less overhead and, and easier migration and obviously faster restarts because we don't have to restart the whole guest operating system. So uh, yeah, the containers are really, really lightweight, uh, as you already might have guessed. The thing is that uh, not only do they not have the operating system and they share binaries, once you create a copy of container, it won't, so basically if it uses the same layer of binaries, it won't actually copy them. It will reuse them as a reference from other container. It will only have the app. What's even cooler, if you modify your app, and if you, for example, add new binaries and add new app code, but still you, you refer to the old one, it will not create completely new container. It will reuse what's possible and then add a small layer here on the binaries and on the app side, which is awesome because, you know, once you keep uh, developing your app, you will have older versions, which will not occupy any space, or you, I guess newer versions won't take much space. They will only take enough space to address the differences. Uh, so it's basically app delta here. And um, yeah, so basically how does Docker works? It's um, pretty straightforward. So you get a Docker file uh, for your source code repository. You build it using the Docker engine. You, you get a container, which you can then push to registry. And using that registry, you can actually deploy it to your Docker host. Um, the registry part is actually optional. You can just build it right in your host and then deploy it right away. Uh, but I won't talk about building and deploying containers in today's lecture. So I will only talk about using Docker for now, and then once we finish our um, uh, backend, I will show you how exactly we can wrap it into a Docker file and how we deploy it as a Docker. All right, so um, I have some additional slides and changes and updates, but I don't think I want to go on with them. So let's just have a fun uh, with the hands-on time. So here's our terminal. And... Um, Let's show you first how it works. So basically, I installed Docker here. As you can see, I have the Docker um, for Mac. I think it's called Docker for Mac. There is well Docker for Windows. It's basically because Docker requires Linux, you cannot easily run it on Mac and Windows. So they created a sort of very lightweight virtual machine that runs Docker inside, and you don't have to manage or um, handle anything. It will do everything for you. So you can see here I located four CPUs and 8 GB of memory for the virtual machine, and now I have Docker running. And uh, if I go to the command line, I will have the Docker command here. So you can see uh, Docker version, as you can see, 1.12 is the latest release, so it works perfectly well. So how does it work? Well, as, as you said, you have container and you have uh, images. So images are exactly what you build. And uh, let's pipe it into Sublime because the formatting is not very nice here. So you can see here are the images that I actually have. There are some images that are mine, and then there's images that I pulled. For example, here's an Ubuntu image, here's Redis, here's Maven, here's MongoDB, uh, RabbitMQ, RethinkDB, and, you know, I even uh, run LaTeX using the uh, Docker. Uh, the thing is that I want to, you know, clutter my system uh, with Shell LaTeX or LaTeX installation because it's a bit of a pain in the ass, so I'm using Docker to just pull the pre-built binaries and run it through Docker. All right, so those are the images, and we're going to play around with the BusyBox. This is the smallest image, and as you can see here, it's just one megabyte of size. So BusyBox is a super tiny Linux. It's essentially a Linux kernel in there. So what do you need to do to run? I mean, basically, first you need to pull, right? So you say docker pull BusyBox. This will actually pull the latest uh, container of BusyBox, but since I already have it, image is updated, so I don't need to pull it. It takes a, a bit of time to pull it from the registry. But, you know, it's quite fast. So then we can do docker run. And I say I want an interactive session. So uh, I say I want to run BusyBox. And um, then I want to say let's run shell. So you can, uh, we can run, the idea is that basically you can send the command to the uh, container you're running. If you run it by default like this, it will run the command specified by default. But you can also provide something. 
So if I say say echo hello, we will actually see execute echo hello inside of the busy box. But you know that's boring, so let's execute shell. So this is I'm actually now inside of the busy box, and this is not my machine anymore. This is one of the Docker containers. Let's open the tab here, another another tab here, and uh, if I do Docker ps, we will see that here's the uh, our busy box, which is running for 12 seconds now, and here's the name. So if we say Docker log, uh, we can see that I executed a less there. So you can actually see the logs and, and everything is pretty nice to uh, monitor things. So let's kill it down now. Uh, cool thing is that if I do uh, you name, you will see that this is actually Linux running with a kernel 4.4 and this is not Mac essentially. Yeah, this is like, this is the power of Docker. So um, the cool thing about it is that I can run any software like this with one command. So if we jump into our repository here and go into server, uh, so we need to add the within DB, right? So let's hit the let's open the package JSON here. What we're gonna do? We're gonna add the new uh, npm script DB run. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say so we're gonna go here and say basically how do you start a database? So we do Docker pull within DB, right? It's gonna pull the latest within DB. I think yeah, there, there have been a small update. So as you can see. It doesn't pull the whole image because I already had those three layers. So it will only pull the updated layers, which is like uh, 70 megabytes and that's it. So uh, I think I'm just gonna cut here uh, because I wanna look, make you look how my stuff downloads. Let me just cut here once it's downloaded and then we can uh, continue the talk. All right, so it's pulled the new image. Uh, now we actually have to start it. So I prepared the command while it was downloading. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna Docker run it. Uh, the minus D flag says it should be run in the background as daemon. So basically, we don't we don't need interactive session here. We just say okay, run it as daemon. Then we're gonna forward the port twenty eight zero fifteen to port twenty eight zero fifteen on the local machine. This is the port we think DB uses for communication. Uh, so we need it to connect to it. And then we're gonna forward port 8080 from inside of the container to port eighty ninety outside. This is the administration UI for everything DB. And then since we want the data to be persistent, so if you remove this part, basically anytime you restart the database, you will lose all the data. Uh, you will, um, so, but you know, we don't want that. We want the data to be persistent. We say minus V, which means volume. So this is the idea of shared folders in, in Docker. We say we want the volume to be the current directory slash DB linked to the slash data, which is the folder where the everything DB stores the, uh, all the data that it basically generates while running. And then we want to name it experts db just you know to have a ways to reference it. So if I go now to the terminal and say npm run db uh, run, yes that's correct. Um, I guess let's do it db start, that makes more sense, right? Um, press the return then start. There we go. So if we do that now, um, I probably, oh yeah because I already have one of the other Docker containers running there is the actually everything to be as well. Uh, let me kill it quickly. It's from my uh, different project. <laughs> so let's check. We have a bunch of exited containers which we can remove as well. So let's see. We have okay Docker remove experts DB. We don't need that anymore. Now we have clean Docker. And if we do now npm run db start it will actually start it. So if we do ps minus a, you can see that it started two seconds ago. We have the bindings working nice here. If we open Chrome now and navigate to localhost 8090, we will actually see the uh, the everything to be administration UI and we can see one server is running. No tables, no indexes, uh, completely clean, obviously, because we just started it, but it works. Um, so let's add some additional commands. So we want db stop, which would be docker stop uh, experts db. That's it. That's all you need to do. So this command, if we execute it, uh, npm run db stop will stop the database. And if we try to um, go to localhost 8090, uh, no, that's not correct. 8090. Now you will see that the site can be reached, obviously, because it stopped. But the thing is that once it stopped, you can actually just start it. So if we do ps minus a, 
you can see that it stopped, but it's still there. So you can just say um, Docker uh, run, Docker start. I'm sorry, and then it will restart it. But you know we don't care about that, so we want as well remove. Uh, so there's gonna be Docker erm experts db. This will remove container, which means that we can then create a new one. Uh, no npm run db rm right so and if we look at the folders now we can actually see that we have the db folder here uh, it would be a good idea to actually ignore it uh, because we don't want the db dumps uh, to be in our git so let's see what we have we have git ignore and we have package json changed which is perfectly exactly what we want git status um, let's see the diff just to make sure that everything is good right okay and now we can commit it uh, oh I did not stage it right let me do that git commit there we go so what did we do add um, npm commands to star command let's let's call it manage database right done so basically uh, all right I, I need my uh, signing key here there we go cool done all right perfect so that's basically it for today's video um, this is basically a very brief introduction to the way you use docker to run things once again once we finish developing the server uh, the api i will show you how to package your own things in an example on uh, you know packaging our backend server um, how to package your own things in the node containers and how to use it for testing and deployment. I will also set up like the small CI uh, thing to run our tests to make sure everything builds. And then later on we'll transform it into a continuous deployment pipeline, which will actually, after tests completed, will deploy it automatically on the live server. All right, so um, that's it for today. In the next video, we're going to use uh, Thinky to connect RethinkDB to our backend. We are gonna implement authentication using Passport.js. Uh, we're gonna obviously finish our APIs and then secure it with Helmet.js. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.